session with yours truly, Dr. Sarah Webb of Colorism Healing. Today's topic is the daughters of colorist fathers. Yes, so we're going to talk about the impact that having, especially being a dark skinned girl and having a father who is colorist or has anti black quote unquote preferences and the kind of impact that that has in the life of children. So we're going to talk about my some of my personal experiences as well as like experiences of people in the media and just observations that I've made in the larger society. This is definitely something I've thought about for many years, but I didn't think to talk about it until someone left a comment a few days ago on one of my posts. And I was like, oh, this thing that I've been thinking about for a long time is actually something I should talk about, right? And not just think about. So that's the topic, colorist fathers and the impact that has on their children, specifically their daughters, but obviously it impacts their sons as well. Um, yeah, let me press recording, record. All right, so again, welcome if you're just tuning in. Um, this is another weekly live stream of Colorism Healing and the topic is Daughters of Colorist Fathers. So I think I wanna pin this. Um, topic here colorist fathers yes and then pin comment that way folks who come into the live chat a little late can see what the topic is hey lucid los hey awake warrior hey ken ken hey gb17 jb1710 what y'all doing what y'all up to let me know where y'all tuning in from and what the weather is like where you are so I must say that I'm still offering speaking, coaching, and consulting services. Although now that the school year has started again, um, I'm not taking on as many clients as I usually do. But if it's something you're interested in, you can still schedule an info session with me to learn about how I might be able to help you in your personal colorism healing journey. And I want to talk about... Um, the dynamic of fathers in general with their daughters, right? And how a lot of what dark skinned people tell me, a lot of dark skinned girls, myself included, have a dark skinned father and a light skinned mother, right? And so our some of our earliest examples of that sort of intimate partnership does not really reflect a person who looks like us. And I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a child psychologist, you know, but you probably can guess that there has been research studies, there are conversations around um, the impact of parents and caregivers or primary caregivers in terms of how we understand ourselves, how we understand the world, um, building self-esteem and that sort of thing as well, right? And so for me, you know, in the past at times, I have thought, you know, about my own father's preferences. And I don't know everybody that he's ever interacted with or dated or that sort of thing. But again, like my mom and my parents were married for several years, um, is several shades lighter than me. She's light skinned, even though it took, it took us a while to get her to, to say that. Um, and then at one point he was dating a white woman for a really long time for several years, right? Um, and so in my memory, those significant relationships in my father's life did not reflect women who were similar to me in terms of appearance, right, or phenotype. And so there I have thought, I remember thinking at times, right, well, if my own father doesn't see beauty in women who look like me, why would I be surprised if other men don't either, right, or if other people don't either, right? And there is something about... Um, the role that fathers play in the overall validation and affirmation of their children, right? And so often we talk about mothers and most of the people who follow my page are, it's like 90% women. So most of you all are mothers, right? And so a lot of times the responsibility or the onus falls on the mother to be the one who affirms and, you know, builds up the self-esteem in that child. And fathers, um, are not as often at the table, are brought into that conversation when it comes to, you know, instilling self-esteem in children, right? 
Um, and so I thought about the comment. And so this comment was on the post I made about um, people's using pretty and light skin as synonyms, right? And like the assumption that, oh, pretty babies also means light skin babies. And so the, the person who left the comment is biracial, right? And their father and their father figures were black. And um, so their father figures, as well as other black men who were in interracial relationships, as they put it in their comment, expressed disappointment. They seemed disappointed that she was biracial and yet she was a darker brown, had a kinkier hair texture, had broader features, right? They were expressing disappointment that, oh, well, you don't have that stereotypically mixed look, right? So this came from, you know, black men in general, but also like her specific father figures. Um, and talking, and so, she also acknowledged that she wonders how, what the impact that has on other girls and women who grew up in households or grew up in families with colorist fathers, right? And regardless of if your father was at home or not, right, that dynamic still matters. Um, sorry, I'm in my niece's room. So you see the, the rainbows and like the pinks and uh, purples around me. <laughs> That's what that is. Um, but I've also like observed people, for example, with dark skinned daughters who then like remarry white women, for example. And I wonder about the narrative, what narratives are being reinforced at home, right? Like if you have, and I actually remember seeing this one time, I was like at a banquet or something and there were three like very dark skinned girls. I think their complexions were probably even darker than mine. And they had a white stepmom. And they seemed to have a pretty good relationship with their white stepmother. But in the back of my mind, um, and I know I'll probably get pushed back for talking about this, in the back of my mind, I just couldn't help but wonder, right, what message or what narrative are those dark-skinned girls internalizing about their own worth and their own value, right, and seeing their father's example of who he chose to partner with. Um, and this is important because words can only go so far. So even if that father and that, that stepmother are telling those girls, oh, you're beautiful, your dark skin is beautiful, your natural hair is beautiful, right? Like that verbal affirmation is important, let's continue to do it, but it only goes so far in comparison to actions, you know? The cliche, actions speak louder than words, okay? Now, I remember reading a research study. I've read a lot of articles and essays about colorism, so I, could, I, didn't, I couldn't even begin to figure out what essay this was, but I will continue to try to look it up like the specific essay. But it was a research study and the participants were dark-skinned women and they were sharing their experiences of having black men in their lives affirm their beauty, right? So they had uncles, they had brothers, they had fathers who said, oh, you're so beautiful, you're beautiful, you're valuable, you're worthy, we love your skin, your skin is pretty. And yet, those men in their lives contradicted that affirmation with their own choices and preferences in the women they would date or marry or partner with, right? And so they were sending these contradictory signals. And here's why, here's another reason why that's important is because that pattern, the pattern of um, black men and other men of other races choosing lighter skinned female partners is confirmed by the larger society, right? So when you compound, not only are like the men in my family, the men who are, who gave, you know, are the reason why I'm here, who are supposed to be the first line of defense in terms of loving me and caring for me and protecting me, not only do they subscribe to white or light as being better, but it's reinforced for me in the larger world. So when I go to school, I'm also seeing that pattern. When I look at TV, I'm also seeing that same pattern. When I look at magazines, when I observe the world around me, I'm seeing that same pattern being confirmed for me, right? Um, and then I think about um, how the, 
I saw I use the media examples, for example. In writing the blog post in preparation for this, I looked up a couple of media examples. And there was one with Erica Campbell, so the Mary Mary singer. I remember this episode. I remember when this episode came out of how Erica Campbell's daughter, a dark skinned, you know, chocolate girl, also, you know, plus size, you know, um, talking to her lighter skinned mother, Erica Campbell, the, the gospel singer, and explaining how she's the only chubby one amongst her friends, right? And how all of her other friends are thin and skinny and the boys don't talk to her because of that, right? Boys at her school always pay attention to the skinny girls. And so Erica is like, oh no, you know, but you're beautiful and you're gorgeous and boys do talk to you. And um, she said, look at you, um, you're a pretty brown face, right? And so that's when her daughter said, oh, and that's another thing, right? I'm also the only dark skinned one. And I think that plays a factor in why boys don't talk to me is because I'm also dark skinned, right? And so her mom, she was telling her mom this and she just kind of was like surprised, like, oh my gosh, like, where is this coming from? I can't believe it. And I think it's all just in your head. I think it's just the way you see things, right? Um, and so I was thinking about that as an example of how dark skinned girls um, who have a dark skinned father and a light skinned mother not only do they not see themselves represented in that sort of family dynamic, but they also don't have anyone to talk to about it. They don't have a parent or a caregiver who can understand, who gets it, right? And so not only are, are dark skinned girls experiencing the colorism, but then they can't really trust or um, depend or rely on one or both of their parents to really help them unpack it, right? And, you know, much less, you know, not even talking about being proactive because that's necessary too. It's necessary to be proactive. But in these cases, like they, the parents weren't even prepared to respond when the daughter brought it to their attention. Right. And so that, that, that dynamic, I think is one that I haven't talked about explicitly and that I don't see other people talking about explicitly often enough is that, yes, it's hard enough to deal with colorism just in the world, but when you're lacking that parental support, when you're lacking that parental representation and the role model of another dark-skinned woman who's um, in a healthy and caring partnership, right? Um, that's important. I also wanna clarify that I am speaking in heteronormative terms, um, and I think that's because it's, the, it's sort of the framework for where these colorist ideas come from, right? And so even in a same sex relationship or even in you know queer relationships and relationships of other types, um, that heteronormative stereotype still influences those relationships as well, right? So like where these biases and norms about dark skin being masculine and light skin being feminine, right? Like that comes from a heteronormative context and it influences other types of relationship dynamics as well. And so I think in terms of understanding where these things come from, a lot of it is based in patriarchy, right? And patriarchal structures as well. Um, but I think about more severe cases, right? So in the case of Erica Campbell, um, it's not, we can't prove that the dad is colorist, right? So not do I have to say it? Not every man who marries a light skinned woman is colorist, right? Um, you have to look at like larger patterns, like what do people say? You know, how do they interact with women of various skin tones and that sort of thing? Um, but I think even just, even if your father is not explicitly colorist, just the fact that the partner he chose is light skinned is enough to send messages, is enough to send signals to the mind of a dark skinned girl, right? Um, but then there are the explicitly colorist fathers. So this includes um, my follower who left that comment, right? She talks about how the men she was referring to were explicitly colorist. They explicitly expressed those values about um, Eurocentric beauty being the more superior, right? And so another of my followers, and I saw them on here, are you still in it? Um, Souls and G-Spots, I think, talked about Lil Wayne. And I have to come back and see if any of you are leaving comments as well. Comments and questions are welcome in the chat as well. 
And I would love to know your experiences, especially if you are a dark skinned girl with a colorist father. <laughs> um, but she talked about um, Souls and G Spots at on Instagram. Little Wayne, right? Little Wayne is a whole thing, right? But his explicit, like really vitriolic type of colorism while having a dark skinned daughter, right? Um, and he's quoted, for those of you who don't know, Lil Wayne's rap lyrics are very colorist. His rap videos are very colorist. But he's also quoted as saying that his dark-skinned child was the first and last dark-skinned child he will ever have, right? So he's quoted as saying this out of his mouth, um, that, the, that he will never again have a give birth to, not give birth to, but have a dark-skinned child. And he's quoted as, as saying that he intentionally partners with, has children with light-skinned non-black women so that his children come out with quote-unquote good hair and light skin. Okay? So this is someone who is like egregiously colorist, like on record as not liking or appreciating the beauty of dark-skinned women, right? And yet his daughter is very, very dark-skinned. And when I was looking up that quote to include in my blog post, I saw that she experiences colorism in the media, right? She's um, a public figure because of who her father is. And people like are explicitly colorist to her. So she's actively experiencing like outright overt colorist attacks in the media. And who does she go to for support? Her dad? No. Because he is the reason people feel it's okay to say those colorist things, right? Like he is in support of those colorist ideas that are being perpetuated against his own daughter, right? And I even think about um, T.I.'s daughter, right? Deja Harris, I think. Um, well, so T.I. is also explicitly colorist, right? Um, in his videos and lyrics and also in his choice of partners like there's a clear pattern there that ti also subscribes to a more eurocentric colorist beauty standard um but his daughter even though she's light-skinned um she has his type 4 hair she has his like kinkier hair texture and so in recent news you people have probably heard of it or seen it in recent news she tweeted that she's so sad to have her dad's hair texture right and again, this is a classic case of a father not doing his part to affirm blackness. This is like a classic case of a father not doing his part to affirm the black features of, his, of himself as well as of his children, right? And again, right, like, um, so I don't know if Tiny is her mom or her stepmom, but even... T.I.'s wife, the um, Tiny from Escape, shout out to Escape, right? One of my favorite 90s R&B groups. Um, but she had like a medical procedure to lighten the color of her eyes, to permanently lighten her eye color, right? So instead of wearing contacts, she had a medical procedure to, to turn her eyes gray permanently, right? And so clearly there's, a, there's some issues within that family dynamic of anti-blackness, of Eurocentric beauty standards. And so we shouldn't be surprised at Deja for saying she doesn't like her hair texture, right? For saying that she's sad that she doesn't have hair more like tiny, you know, straighter and longer. Um, and so this is like multiple instances where fathers have not either, best case scenario, they simply haven't shown up to affirm the black beauty of their black children. And worst case scenario, they've explicitly said colorist things, like explicitly expressed hateful anti-blackness, right? Even with in the context of talking about their own children, right? Um, I want to talk more about this because I also got another comment on my post that I want to address as well, but I saw that I missed some comments. Um, Brittany Cannon says, you may have said or done this, but have you done one on colorist mothers yet? Not yet, but I talk about moms way more often than I talk about fathers. So, <laughs> um, Kim Kim heard a quote from Brittany Cooper saying that black men don't feel like they owe black women anything when it comes to the politics of intimacy. I think this topic illuminates her thoughts. 
Yes, Ken Ken. Thank you for that. First of all, shout out to Brittany Cooper. I love Brittany Cooper's work. Um, ever since the Crunk Feminist Collective back in the day, like in the early days of blogging. But yeah, there is this sort of um, absence of Black men in the conversations around Black beauty in particular, right? And I know I got some brothers watching right now. I'm going to get to y'all. <laughs> Um, Brittany Cannon says, this makes me think that clip of Tina Campbell and her daughter. She noticed her dark skinned dad and men in the fam picked light skinned women. Yeah, see, Brittany Cannon, we were on the same page. <laughs> Literally me my whole life. Aw, I'm sorry. Yeah, and this is why I'm talking about this, right? Because we talk a lot about colorism just like in society, but that dynamic of like, yes, my dark skinned dad chose a light skinned woman. And so what does that tell me or what is that teaching me about what I can expect on the dating market, right? Um, Black Knight 06, 26.2 says she told her mother that her mother didn't understand because she was light skinned. It was significant. Yes, yes. She explicitly articulated that. Um, Thank you for, you know, putting that out there in the comment. So Erica Campbell's daughter explicitly said, well, you're light skinned, so you don't, you wouldn't get it. You don't understand, right? Um, and so I have like words to say too, like towards the end, I kind of want to share and thinking about what we can do in response to this dynamic. Um, light skinned moms have a responsibility, right? To get it, to be proactive in understanding what colorism is. Light-skinned moms cannot get away with being oblivious to what their dark-skinned daughters are going through or might be going through, right? Like, light-skinned moms have to do the work in themselves um, to be aware and to... Also, like, I think Erica Campbell's reaction of like, no, I don't, I don't think that's true. And, and boys do talk to you. And, you know, there are all sorts of beautiful dark skinned women like Gabrielle Union and, you know, Michelle Obama and all these things. I think there's a, a way to acknowledge and validate the reality that your daughter is experiencing while also allowing her to see examples and role models of people who look like her, right? And so I think it's it was a little dismissive. I'll say that. Like if you watch the clip, it just felt very dismissive to me. Um, but again, that's that seems like a natural reaction if you're not proactively thinking about how to have these conversations, right? Um, Keisha Harris, hey Keisha, this is so important. Yeah, I agree. Um, woo, Matthew Knowles is coming to mind. <laughs> Brittany Cannon, Matthew Knowles is a great example, right? Even though his daughters are both light skinned, um, it's obvious that Solange in particular, the younger sister, also the browner sister, also the sister with the, you know, wider nose, it's, it's clear that there is, um, his attitudes about color very much influenced his daughters, right? Even though they were light-skinned, they were more apt to lean on light-skinnedness because of those values that were shared in the home. And we know that he, again, chose Tina Knowles because he thought she was white when he first met her. But even though she wasn't white, he was like, well, she's close enough, right? His words, right? I'm paraphrasing, but these are his admitting. He admitted this himself, right? Um, Lucid Lowe says, both my parents are lighter skinned. They just have different undertones. I inherited my skin color from my grandmother and my mother made sure to remind me every chance she got. Yes. So the that's the that's thing too, right? Lucid Lowe's is that I, I'm talking a lot about the dark skinned father, light skinned mother dynamic, and then having like a dark skinned daughter. But it's possible to have two parents who are the same color and the child is a different color than both of their parents, right? Um, but again, like in every scenario, parents have to check their own biases. The parents have to check their own privileges, right? So again, thinking about if the father is light-skinned, check your privilege. If the mother is light-skinned, check your privilege as a light-skinned woman. If the father is dark-skinned, check your male privilege, right? Because dark-skinned men have male privilege, right? 
And so also check your biases. Knowing that we all live in this white supremacist culture, parents have to be conscious that they are not internalizing these biases and and inadvertently passing them on to their children, right? Um, And then again, not being oblivious that colorism is out there and is real, y'all. Like parents, if you know a parent, if you are a parent, if you work with parents, like help them to know, like just like you have to teach children to, you know, share their toys, you have to teach children to say no if there's a bully at school. Like colorism is part of those conversations, you know, in terms of making sure our children have healthy self-esteem, especially black children. Yeah, okay. Hey, Sarah, how you doing? <laughs> he just said, Lord, Lil Wayne. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's a, a really big um, issue that's bigger than colorism even. Like his, he has a lot going on there that's exacerbating his colorist ways. Um, thank you, Lucid Lopes, for the badge. Thank you so much. Love, love, love you for your support. Sanga Kulu says, my grandfather was colorist towards my mom and her sister and spoiled their lighter biracial half-sisters. Sanga Kulu, this is the exact example I'm talking about, right? Yes, there has been a lot of documentation of fathers who had Black children and then remarried and had biracial children and treated their white wife and their biracial children better than their black children, right? And I remember looking at one study in Brazil, looking at Afro-Brazilians, about how the dark, this was, and these were sons, right? So I've been talk, focusing on daughters for a reason, but there were sons, right? And the lighter skinned son admitting that his father treated him better because he was lighter skinned and that his father kicked out his darker skinned brother like when he was still a teenager, right? Kicked him out of the house. And so, yeah, that dynamic is documented. And so you providing additional testimony, I think is something that those of us who care about this issue have to acknowledge that that dynamic is a real one. Um, And so again, oftentimes, we focus a lot on the colorism of mothers and how mothers perpetuate colorism, how mothers tell their children to stay out of the sun, how mothers tell daughters not to wear red lipstick, how mothers get mad if their daughter tries to uh, go natural, right? And I, as I was talking about at the beginning of this you know, live stream, um, we don't, because of patriarchy, Fathers almost get a pass in terms of their role in rearing the children. And I think that plays a lot in it, right? Is that people assume that the mother is the one responsible for instilling self-esteem and for teaching children, you know, these certain values. And so fathers kind of culturally speaking um, are not held as accountable for the upbringing and the instilling and the teaching and the education of children the way mothers are held responsible. Um, But, you know, we don't, I don't subscribe to that. I think every parent, if it's three parents, six parents, one parent, like anyone who's involved in the life of a child has that responsibility to nurture that child, to pour into that child and to help further that child's growth and development, right? Um, Aw, thank you, Sarah, for the badge. You're so sweet. Um, Sorrel says, and why are the proud and overt colorist, texturist, usually dark skinned men and are men with features that they hate so audibly? Um, yeah, so Sorrel, this points to the other comment I mentioned. So I forget the user's name, um, but this was a, a black male, I believe, who talked about how these colorist fathers are often dark skinned themselves and how it's definitely a manifestation of their own hatred for their own skin tone self-hatred for their own features Um, because in in the comment under the announcement post I made, they acknowledged how you can't be a dark-skinned person with a preference for lighter skin without acknowledging the fact that you therefore dislike your own skin tone, right? And so like some of my advice in terms of, you know, fathers, especially if they're dark-skinned fathers who are perpetuating colorism is 
in addition to checking your bias and your privilege, is to do your healing work, right? Like hurt people hurt people. And so, yes, we understand that a dark-skinned father might be struggling with his own issues around self-love and self-esteem and feeling rejected as a child. Um, but that doesn't mean you get a free pass to perpetuate abuse and harm on your own daughter, nonetheless, much less anyone else, right? Um, and so I think as I was preparing for this, I thought a lot about, um, you know, centering daughters and centering black women um, and dark skinned women and how there's a lot of work to be done amongst black men in particular and I have done my share of work. You know, I, I did a YouTube series called Men on Colorism, where I interviewed like several black men about their experiences with colorism. Um, I've had, you know, black men and um, Latinx men on my live streams to talk about colorism. But I also was thinking about how as a dark skinned black woman who has been targeted by lots of black men in instances of colorism, that the onus should not be on me, right? Like I can hold space occasionally, but I don't feel like I should bear the burden of saving these dark skinned black men from themselves, right? Um, and so part of what my ask is in terms of how we can all show up and do this work is for the black men who get it to continue to be vocal and to start your own platforms where you can hold space for dark-skinned Black men to do their work. Because I have to acknowledge that I, as a dark-skinned Black woman, do not have the emotional capacity to hold space for Black men in that way at this point in time. <laughs> so transparency there. Um, but yeah, it's the, you know, we are always asked to save the community, right? Black women, but especially us darker skinned black women are always asked to be martyrs and to put ourselves on the line for the benefit of all black people. And so I'm, I'm choosing not to hold space in that way for black men. I'm happy to have conversations. I continue to have conversations with black men around these issues. I'm, you know, Jordan Sambu is actually one um, black man who's very vocal, who's very active online, intentionally and proactively using his platform to talk about colorism, raise awareness about colorism. Um, I've done like live, what's that app? What's the name of that app? Clubhouse. <laughs> clubhouse interviews with him and that sort of thing so I'm happy to like have conversations and like spread information but in terms of like holding that space for the healing work um that I'm not offering that right now I don't think uh it's productive to my own healing and emotional safety to do that work at this time <laughs> um let's see in say says little Wayne's comments are outrageous Wonder why the general public has not reacted strongly to his comments. Um, so his comments are outrageous, and I think they're several years old. So in terms of the news cycle, it's been like out of the news cycle for a very long time because it was a few years ago when those comments were made. And I don't remember the public reaction being what I would want it to be, right? But I know there were people speaking out about it. Um, but... Just like, you know, in terms of cancel culture and that sort of thing, like as egregious as those comments were, as egregious as his lyrics are, um, there are people who just value, their values are entertainment first, right? Celebrity culture first, popularity first, um, over, you know, what's right. And that's an unfortunate part of where we are today. Thank you, Latanya R. Moore. Thank you for tuning in and for buying a badge. I really appreciate you for that. Um, Sorrel says, light-skinned Black people choose to not understand. Yeah. there And there are dark-skinned Black people who choose to not understand as well. <laughs> I've, I've seen people of all skin tones perpetuate colorism 
And I don't mean in a reverse colorism sense. I mean, there are dark skinned people, just like the dark skinned black men we're talking about. There are dark skinned black men, dark skinned black women who are also anti dark skin, right? They've internalized that to the point where it's like, well, yeah, you know, I prefer light skinned men. Or yeah, I prefer light skinned women. And that's, I'm perfectly within my right to do that. And it, it's so, so rampant and ingrained and entrenched. Um, but I think for light skinned people, it's easier to be oblivious, oblivious. It's easier to choose the will, the willful ignorance, right? Is what I often refer to it as. Um, both Dr. Dre and Lil Wayne had an interview where they were actively colorist. This is why I stopped listening to their work. Also, it's not as good. Yeah. And this is from Sego Pets, Pex. I'm always terrible at screen names, y'all. I apologize. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I I did, do not listen to Lil Wayne. And there are a lot of other, like Neo, like Neo made a co off comment one time when he was like, oh yeah, you know, light skinned babies are always the prettiest anyway. And I was like, well, I can't listen to Neo anymore. <laughs> I'm quick to cut somebody off for colorism, right? Um, game changers with Fabian Lyon. Hello there. Color is dad stem from an insecurity within themselves. They project onto others. Yeah, I think a lot of the color, like just like with bullying in general, right? So if you want to pan out and talk about like all so so social issues, right? There's definitely like insecurity of the person who's perpetuating that issue. Um, you know, so again, like as a society, as a culture, we have to realize that these men have healing. They have wounding that they need to work on. But I'm not going to tolerate your abuse just because you need to, you have healing work to do, right? Like just because you were abused or traumatized doesn't mean I tolerate and accept your abuse and neglect or harm towards me, right? And that's the difference, right? Like we can be compassionate and understanding while also holding people accountable and responsible and putting up boundaries wherever necessary. Um, Sangha Kulu says the family seemed like they focused more on Beyonce. And I noticed she was in beauty pageants quite a bit as a kid. Yeah, def oh, they definitely focused on Beyonce over Solange. <laughs> and it's um, it played right into the hands of what mainstream pop music would accept, right? They knew, like, they knew that Beyonce was the marketable child, was the child that would be able to um, move through mainstream entertainment, you know, in ways that Solange would not. Yeah, all right. So I think I have, there was one other thing. I kind of got into it because of the comments, because I was going to save my little discussion about, you know, black men needing spaces to heal, needing um, to be free of the social stigma, right? And even thinking about, you know, the recent suicide of the actor from The Wire, right? And I never watched The Wire, but um, one of my followers, I love my followers because y'all just be sending me like gems and nuggets, right? So one of my followers sent me a video of him talking about how one of his issues was his skin tone. You know, one of his issues, you know, when he was working through his drug addictions and things like that was that he grew up insecure and his dark skin tone was one of the things that contributed to him and his, you know, emotional um, pain. And um, so black men do need to be free of the social stigma of working on their mental health. Right. Like black men should be able to take time to work on their mental health, work on their emotional needs, ask for help without the social stigma of that. Um, but I think we need more black men to step up and hold space for that. Right. And not ask or expect black women to hold the space for black men's healing. Right. Like there are black men who can do that. There are black men who can hold space for the healing of black men. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Um, um, Weezy uh, Graham says, I wish you could talk to the folks at Getting Grown Pod about this. I think it would be such a fruitful convo. Okay, well, um, I will try to look at what they are about. I can't, I don't know, maybe they have already reached out to me. I have, um, 
like lots of unread DMs. I don't know, Instagram just suddenly showed me like unread DMs from like 42 weeks ago, like six months ago. I was like, where were these DMs six months ago? Why am I just now seeing them? But anyway, <laughs> uh, Sangaku says, yep, we are harder towards the mother compared to the father. Transparency, I have a dark-skinned daughter and about two years ago, I purposely decided to only pursue dark-skinned women for relationships. Black Knight 06, 26.2. Thank you for that transparency. I respect you for that decision. That is, you are demonstrating that you prioritize your daughter's life above your own personal preferences. But even, even saying that, like, it's also, like, I want people to know that you don't have to try hard to find valuable, beautiful, attractive, relationship worthy dark skinned women right because there's that assumption too right like a lot of black men justify not dating black women or not dating dark skinned women as if there's a shortage of dateable dark skinned women there's not we're all we're out there hundreds of them are watching this live stream right now <laughs> not hundreds because there's only 18 of y'all at this moment but you know what i mean <laughs> um all right, so I'm gonna summarize a little bit because answering questions, I know I've kind of might have some loose strings out there. Um, and Satan says, to condemn someone for what you share together can only mean that you see it as something inherently bad. Interesting, yeah, so I think you're referring to, and I, Correct me if I'm wrong. I think you're referring to like parents who um, like blame their partner for having like a darker skinned child, right? Or blame their partner because their child doesn't have the hair texture that they hoped for. Um, and that I've seen that dynamic play out too. This is a fictional example, okay? Full disclosure, this is a fictional example, but Toni Morrison's book, God Help the Child, that's how the book opens. It starts out with two light-skinned parents having a very dark-skinned child, and the father is enraged at the mother, thinks she cheated on him, blames her for having a dark-skinned child, walks out, leaves the mother and the child to fend for themselves, right? Um, but yeah, thinking about even uh, the conversation I was having about interracial couples and how people, you know, assume like, oh, interracial couples are going to have such pretty babies. And so one of one of my followers left a comment that now she responds. She's a black woman in an interracial relationship. So now she responds with saying, yes, and I hope the child looks just like me. Right. And she says that people are like flabbergasted and don't know what to say. <laughs> like, oh, oh OK. <laughs> So she was like, yeah, my children are going to be beautiful and I hope they look just like me, right? So not fetishizing or pedestaling like um, the ambiguous features, but saying like, I, you know, a child who looks like me would also be cute and beautiful. It's not just because they might also have some of their father's features that's going to make them beautiful. Protect your energy. Thank you, Keisha. I got to protect my energy. Um, Seagull Peck says, yes, please. If any of the men watching this do this, I would love to show those videos to my dad. Yeah. Um, yep, Jordan and other black men go after him. Facts, men by definition should fix men's problems. Focus on yourselves first and foremost. Yeah, and this is from Deep House Nation 7. Uh, Lucid Lowe says, yes, Neo is a colorist. I feel like I'm way behind on my comments. Let me catch up. Um, let's talk with Tara says great discussion as a black woman living in California I had a black man tell me that if you want a black man to love you you got to leave Cali because Asian and Hispanic sisters are high priority I experienced that too in California let's talk with Tara I lived in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area for a while and I experienced that a lot where black men exercise colorism by dating Asian and Latinx women because they, they felt like they were more guaranteed to have a different gene pool, right? Because it was, it's very twisted and sorted, I know, but they, a lot of times the, the rationale was, well, even a light-skinned black woman might still produce dark-skinned babies, 
right? Like even a light-skinned black woman is still associated with blackness. And since I'm anti-black, you know, I'm just going to date like an Asian woman or like, a, you know, a Filipina or a Latinx woman or a Chicana. And uh, yeah, and so it, colorism was hard to pick up in, in the Bay Area because it it's anti-blackness at the end of the day. Um, but the reason that a lot of black men, you know, were dating Asian women or Latinx women was because of those features and that hair, the hair texture, the long straight hair, right? So it was still about pre preferring or preferencing lighter skin and like straighter hair textures. But because it was women of a different race, people weren't identifying it as colorism, but I always did. I was like, oh, that's, that's just like California's version of colorism, right? Like they are so colorist that they're like, we're just going to not date any black woman, not even the light skinned black women. And we're going to date, you know, brown and lighter women of different races. That was a very real thing that I witnessed. Um, child Beyonce stanched Kelly's career. <laughs> Says I met God, she black. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, Matthew knows Beyonce's father was the manager of the group. So it's not surprising that he was, a very skilled marketer and promoter and PR person for his daughter. Like that was such a planned strategic career trajectory on that, on their part. Um, Lucid Lowe says, OMG, I'm so sorry you had to go through that. However, I'm not surprised. That's Cali, sadly. <laughs> Have you done a live on Afro Latinos and the colorism they face within their families in the Latin community? I have not done one myself, but I brought Edlin Veris um, on um, and he talked a lot about his experiences um, in the Dominican Republic and Latinx culture more broadly. Um, and then I also had um, Jorge, Jorge on to talk about his experiences as a Latinx man. Um, who's also a gay Latinx man, right? And so thinking about the intersections of masculinity with colorism, right? So I've had a couple of guests who've spoken to that, but I haven't done like my own live yet. Um, oh, okay, yeah. So I'm um, Wiza Graham. So they talk about issues affecting black women and have previously expressed wanting to bring a colorism expert on. Awesome. Well, you can um, send them a link to this live. <laughs> All right. So let me do a quick recap. I, I hate um, not reading your comments, though, because they're always so good. Sorrell says it's especially hurtful and frustrating when black people who are so articulate and analytical about power, privilege, and white supremacy, but then all that analysis suddenly goes out the window when it comes to colorism. 100% fam, 100%. Um, as a mixed person, I'm so glad she said that. Yeah, right? Um, it's like, yeah, our children will be beautiful, and if they look like me, they'll be beautiful, right? No matter what they look like. Um, we shouldn't just assume that children are beautiful because they are, have a certain complexion or certain features. In North Korea, Vietnam, etc., the new revolutionaries banned the icons and imagery of their predecessors. We never underwent a cultural purge to get white features off a pedestal. Deep House Nation 7. Yeah. There, I think the Black is Beautiful movement was our best effort to date. And it was highly problematic in and of itself. It was incomplete in many ways, as much good as it did. Um, I think there, it was not as effective as we needed it to be, right? Um, but that doesn't mean we can't do it now, right? Like we still, no time like the present, right? We can still do that. Um, okay. <laughs> it's a lot of lost and confused color struck need grows on the West Coast. <laughs> Somewhere between 2040 and 2060, colorism is supposed to overtake racism as the main form of oppression. Yeah, Black Night 06, 26.2. That's because 
people's ideas about race are changing. That's because people's concepts of race are evolving and changing and because more people are becoming mixed race, which is therefore forcing us to challenge our notions of race, right? Um, I was talking, someone left this comment. I've been getting this comment on my blog since 2013, right? There's some like strand of folks who are out there saying, well, there, there are no such thing as light-skinned black people. And I was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, but they're like, oh, all light-skinned people are mixed, are biracial, or have mixed ancestry. And I was like, I understand that, but what do you, how do you explain fraternal twins where one of the fraternal twins is light and one is dark? They have the exact same ancestry, and yet you're going to say that one of them is mixed and the other one is not, right? Like, that's where that logic breaks down. But what I was saying to them in, in my comment as a response is that we can't talk about race as if it's logical. <laughs> race is not a logical system. It's not math. It's not chemistry. It's not even biology. Race is not even biology. Race is not a logical system. It was created by delusional white supremacists. Race, the system of race as we know it today, was created, imagined, birthed by delusional white supremacist capitalist patriarchs for their own benefit. So if I'm having a conversation with someone and they're trying to talk about race as if it is logical and rational and black and white and these people are that and these people, I'm like, that's race is not a, a logical, rational system. We cannot talk about it as if it is. Right. And to do so would be to take would be to take on a white supremacist lens. Right. Like white supremacy says that race is finite, that race is biological, that race makes sense. Right. Like that was a white supremacist system to begin with. It's like, oh, these people are black and these people are white. And that's it. Like that's it's not a logical system. Um, what are your opinions on Beyonce's album, Black is King? I have not listened to the album. <laughs> I have not seen the album. I've seen like a video of it. Um, but I thought it was, I said this in a previous live too. I thought it was really interesting that for some of the images, like Beyonce's skin is the darkest it's ever been. And I just think that it's, it feels disingenuous to me that throughout her career, she's been fine with having like really light skin on all of her album covers and all of her music videos. But like for Black is King, like her skin tone is the darkest it's ever been. And this was the um, brown skin girl video. Cause I remember that the, the scene where her and Kelly Rowland are like embracing each other. And I'm like, there's almost like no difference in their skin tones. Like they almost make their skin tones the same. And to me that waters down the impact of the story of the song itself, right? So, yeah. <laughs> but I'm not going to give a full opinion because I haven't seen it, really, to do an analysis of it. Um, Sanger Kula says, colorism did precede racism, so I'm not surprised about the increasing blatant colorism. And the darkening of her skin is like how Will Smith was in darker lighting for the film King Richard. Yeah, no problem, six pins in a shoe. That's a fun screen name to say, six pins in a shoe. Um, but yeah, colorism existed before racial categories existed, especially as we know them in the United States. So that's the other thing too, like proof that race is not a logical, rational system is that it's different depending on where you go, right? So like, especially in Latin America and the Caribbean, like their concept of race is really different than our concept of race in the United States, right? So again, we have to talk about it as the social construct that it is. Yeah. So again, folks, thanks for tuning in. Um, your comments were amazing. Amazing. Your comments are my favorite parts about the live. And I'm going to do more lives where we just get on here and you all just leave comments and ask questions and like leave comments and I read your comments. And, you know, so I'll do that more often where instead of planning, you know, a little spiel at the beginning, I'll just like freestyle with your comments as my guide. Um, thank you, Mixed Bloom Room. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Webb. This has been amazing. 
Oh, thank you. I appreciate you too. Thank you, Sego Pex. I'm, I know I'm not saying that correctly. <laughs> Keisha, thank you. This is so good. So just to, as a wrap up and for anyone who might have joined the live late, we've been talking about the impact of colorist fathers on their children, especially darker skinned daughters. And I'll leave you all with reminders about how I see us responding to that. And as I mentioned, one, fathers have to do their own work. Fathers have to do their healing work. Fathers have to check their privilege as men, as check their male privilege. And if they're light skinned, check, also check their light skin privilege. And realize that they are also responsible for the upbringing and rearing and instilling and education and growth and nurturing of their children. Um, and then I also called upon Black men in general to those of those of you who already are continue holding space for Black men to gain awareness and you know promote change, and for other Black men who haven't quite shown up and um, stepped up in that way, like we need more of you, more Black men to be in the trenches with us. Um, and for mothers, continue doing the, the work that you do, right? Moms, uh, as I mentioned several times throughout this, we all, mothers and women often are expected to bear the brunt of um, growing and nurturing children. Um, but light-skinned mothers in particular, um, be aware, right? It's not, cool to be oblivious as a light-skinned mom, especially it's like no matter what skin tone your children have, but if you're a light-skinned mother with a dark-skinned child, it's that much more necessary for you to like learn, study, listen, pay attention, and be proactive and be ready to have these conversations when they do come up. Um, and then for the daughters, for my fellow dark-skinned daughters, um, we did not create this problem, but we also have power and agency as well. We have agency and power as the daughters of colorist fathers are parents who simply were oblivious, right? Or, you know, whatever it is, um, to do our own healing, right? So like, even though we did not create the wound, we have the power and the responsibility to heal it for ourselves and to support other dark-skinned daughters out there, right? Support the other dark-skinned women in your circle. Um, and don't don't be that dark-skinned sister who pretends like it's not a thing. Don't be the dark-skinned sister who's like, oh girl, that don't bother me, all. that's not a thing, or who cares, right? Like, as a dark-skinned woman, I've had other dark-skinned women be very dismissive and um, give me a lot of pushback for talking about colorism, right? So yeah, I think everyone, no matter who we are, can, find their lane in terms of addressing colorism. And so I hope you all do that. Um, I really, really appreciate you all for showing up today, whether you're watching live or watching the recording on YouTube or IGTV or listening to the podcast. You're amazing. And this is the highlight of my life is doing this work for and with all of you. Mwah! Love ya! <laughs>